Hello. <laughs> I know you heard me earlier, but now they're recording. So, so my name is Tony Ryan. I'm here to talk about Shine, projects on Shine, the science behind food and energy sustainability. And the reason I'm here to talk about it is we hear people all the time talking about saving the planet. And actually, the planet is going to be fine. What we have to do is save the people. And the reason we have to save the people is because we are really screwing our planet up. And there are too many of us, and we are consuming too much, and we haven't learned the lessons that Mary came to teach us. I was really pleased, I've got the wrong one of those as well. So I'm a follower, not a leader, and the person I've cho chosen to follow is George Porter. George Porter was my predecessor as Professor of Physical Chemistry at the University of Sheffield. And he got the Nobel Prize for a technique in chemistry called flash photolysis. And that allows you to study reactions that are caused by light. And George came up with this beautiful um, five billion year clock. Uh, and and this, is, this is something, it looks like he drew it with Creole. Uh, and I hope that is the case. And, um, and it's the history of our planet, the 4.6 billion years of our planet. That he drew it 30 years ago, and I'm using it today as irrelevant, right? In this 4.6 4 billion year time scale. So, so first we have a rocky planet, uh, then there was some kind of chemical evolution, some interesting reactions kicked off. Uh, these molecules essentially talked to each other, reproduced, um, and became bugs. Those bugs did Fermentation, and they did fermentation in an atmosphere that's not like the atmosphere we know today. Uh, and they scavenged chemical energy. And then eventually, some of them learned to use the fantastic amount of energy landing on the surface of the planet rather than scavenging energy. And they started to do photosynthesis. And that photosynthesis changed the planet. Because what happened was, after a billion years of photosynthesis, the atmosphere changed and it became 20% oxygen. And the reason that happened was because those photosynthetic bugs excreted oxygen as their waste product. Those photosynthetic bugs deposited that oxygen in the water in the sea where they lived. That oxygen oxidized the soluble iron from iron 2 to iron 3, which is the insoluble form of iron, and laid down the iron ore that we dug up in the Industrial Revolution to create the fantastic cities of the north of England. Yeah. Made by bugs. <laughs> Iron ore was made by bugs. Those bugs then evolved. I heard on the radio on the way here, the first complex brain has been found from an insect and it's half a billion years old. We arrive very, very late in this story. There were lots of complicated animals in the sea but the things that came onto the land were the plants, and the animals followed them. And the plants grew to produce this beautiful planet, and as my colleagues in the botany department tell me, the animals have been trying to screw it up ever since. And we are the dominant animal. So, George showed us the way into studying photosynthesis. Now, There, there are, if, you, if you're a physical chemist like me, there are essentially two important reactions that take place on the surface of our planet. The first one is, is light comes into a chloroplast. That light interacts with the chloroplast and, and that energy is used to take carbon dioxide and make it an energy storage thing, a carbohydrate. And it uses a vector called ATP. And then that happens only in plants and algae. And then everything else on the earth, all the, all the metabolism in the plants and all the animals use that energy store, that sugar, those carbohydrates, to drive all those processes, all their processes, through mitochondria. And, and that, if, if, if there aren't those two reactions, there's no life on earth as we know it uh, in its majority, and we wouldn't be here. And it's all driven by the sun. So if we canter through evolution, 
Yeah, we, we've done books. We're going to jump straight out of the sea onto the land and into these people. Okay, so so we've, we've all of a sudden we've got humans. Uh, we've only been here for 150,000 years of those 4.6 billion years. Uh, there should only actually be about 2 million of us. At one point, there were only 70,000 breeding pairs, and we know that from the genetics of the mitochondria. Why are there 7 billion of us now? The answer is that we were the only animals that wanted to do more than exist, that wanted to live at more than the limit of their food supply. And in between, these very early humans and these Victorians, in evolutionary terms, it's but a blink of the eye. But something fundamentally changed. <coughs> 400 years ago, everything that happened on the face of the earth was driven by sunshine. The energy arrived from the sun and it was used in year, to use an accounting term. Very little of it was passed over to the next year. 400 years ago, there were less than a billion people. In the vast majority, they lived on a subsistence diet. They still lived essentially at the limit of food supply, because every innovation that humans made was used to grow more food and make more people. And the population ebbed and flowed with the food supply. 400 years ago, Europe was entering the Industrial Revolution. But then, as today, the most fertile place on the earth, the most fecund place on the earth, was Southeast Asia. Because of a, of a confluence of, of ingenuity, of farming methodology, and most importantly, of people. And there was no coal, or oil, or gas. There was no buried sunshine driving the economy. Then, we entered what we will see is a historical anomaly. We had a society that was essentially in solar deficit. It was using more energy than it was collecting because it was digging it up from out of the ground. The sunshine that had been buried during all those fossilizations. And the population started to grow. It had been doubling at the rate of once every thousand years. And then all of a sudden, as the Industrial Revolution started, it doubled, started to double at the rate of 150 years. And in fact, in the UK, our population increased by a factor of 4.5 between 1800 and 1900. How did we cope with that? Well, quite easily, we just put more acres under the plough. The problem was, those acres weren't ours. They were someone else's. The Empire, the Commonwealth. And then, a century later, between 1900 and 2000, when the Earth's population increased by the same factor of 4.5, there weren't more planets to put under the plough. We had to do it on this one. And science came to the rescue. Because science, through the Harbour-Bosch process, allowed us to make the land more fertile. The combination of a chemical innovation and what's called the Green Revolution increased crop yields by an order of magnitude, a factor of 10 in some cases. And that allowed the Earth's population to continue to grow. So now we're looking at 7 billion people about six months ago, and it could be 9, it could be 10. How are we going to feed them? And if you ever thought that this the, you know, this, this global warming thing, and it wasn't happening. Look at this graph. The red line is the consumption of oil, and the blue line is the Earth's population. We eat oil. We existentially depend on oil. Because if we were all organic, if there was no fertilizer, there would only be two billion people on the Earth. 
Five billion people would die of starvation. We need organic, we need inorganic fertilizer, chemical energy fertilizer to survive. So, there are seven billion people on the earth. There are a billion crazy consumers, that's us. There are three billion trying to catch up in Brazil, India, China. Every year, we release 10 million years worth of buried sunshine in the form of carbon dioxide. And the oil and the gas is running out. And that's why, at the University of Sheffield, we're running Project Sunshine. We know the world's in long-term crisis. Too many people, not enough food, unsustainable economic growth. Came here tonight, forgot to pack a change bag. No problem, I can buy three pairs of undies at Tesco's for a pound. Absolutely bonkers. Our throwaway society means we are throwing away the livelihood of our children and grandchildren. In the medium term, we can get there, we can frack more gas. We can use coal and oil, we can even work on renewables. And we have to do nuclear power, as I'm sure we'll hear later on. But in the long term, we need to go back to the future. We need to go back to sunshine in real time. And we need to find ways of getting over the intermittency problem. And we need to grow more food in a sustainable way, at scale. Doing it in towns or on grass verges to educate is fantastic, but we need to feed everybody. So, we're working on capturing the energy from the sun. There's more than enough energy from the sun. The problems are turning it from sunshine to something useful. And something useful could be electricity, or it could be a solar fuel. We could start to do synthetic photosynthesis and make liquid fuel in synthetic trees. But the real quick solution, or the medium term solution, is to make more effective photovoltaics to turn sunshine into electricity. And we only need to collect one hour of the sun's energy to power the whole of the Earth's economy for a year. And if you could make that little yellow square in America a big 10% efficient solar cell, that will provide enough energy for America's economy. And it may be that a patch of land the size of Tobedon could provide enough, even with all that wind and rain and mist, could provide enough energy for the UK's economy. Because our ultimate security, energy security, is a fusion reactor that's actually 93 million miles away, and it's called the sun. We need to understand better this reaction of photosynthesis. So, 40 years ago, no one knew these bugs existed. Prochlorococcus. There's 10,000 of them in every milliliter of seawater. There's 10 to the power 28 of them on the earth at any one time. Their turnover, they reproduce themselves every day and a half. That's 10 to the power 30, one with 30 zeros after it, cells per year. And there's 10 to the 11, that's 200 million, trillion, billion, zillion, I can't work out what it is. I can only talk in these 10 to the power terms, dry weight. Right? There's a thousand times more in mass of these bugs than there are people. There's only um, 100 million tons of human beings. We're making a mess of our atmosphere and these bugs are working hard to keep it right. The mass of human beings and their domestic animals is more than the mass of all the other mammals on the planet. That's why I said there should only be two million of us. Because we're wrong. So we need to work on food security. So there are some statistics here. Seven billion people on the earth. A billion are chronically undernourished. 180 million children are underweight. 400 million women are anemic. But this is the frightening statistic. In Africa, per capita food intake is 20% less than it was 
50 years ago. If that was a story about the UK, it'd be a result. There'd be less obese people. It's not a good story about Africa. And as these populations move towards us, they will, need, they will want to eat more protein and we've got to help them. And that's why we need to reconnect plants to their environment, to reintroduce them to bugs and microbes in the soil and stop doing large scale monoculture in essentially sterile soil and putting everything in by human beings. We need to reconnect with the land and understand the molecules, the plants and the farming systems. We set this task, what's the energy content of a cup of tea? to our physics undergraduates. They had to go out and calculate every energy content. I guessed the answer. I thought the answer would be 70% of the energy in a cup of tea is the water. You have milk and sugar, it turns out that 36% of the energy in a cup of tea is producing the milk. Milk worked when there wasn't many people because it's really energy dense and there's butter, it's easy to transport. But as we've evolved in our society, we've taken milk with us. I'm not advocating becoming a vegan, but if you really want to be kind to the environment, become a vegan and make your last meat meal your pets. Because that's what you need to do to be good to the environment. To understand these problems and work to a global solution, rather than a local solution, you need to understand what's happening on a global scale. So we work on global change in the environment, modelling the Earth. We want to solve the global food energy cycle at the macro scale, so we know the right interventions to make at the micro and local scale. It may well be that we need to change our energy vectors. We need to move away from oil to some other liquid fuel, but we certainly don't need to move to hydrogen. So at the University of Sheffield, we're struggling to get our heads around this massive problem in order to do the right research to solve the problems at a local scale, to bring together communities, big business and academy to make the world a more sustainable place for us all to live. Thank you.